sort of chronologically through Emily Dickinson's life. Um, so this is early um, period, uh, the early map, and her parents, um, a copy of the uh, portrait of her and her siblings, and then it follows sort of through um, as she grows up. Um, One of the things I liked uh, reading on your webpage about your collection, both about Emily and uh, Robert Frost, is that you really try to encompass their whole lives. It's not just, hey, let's have a few poems or you know, a few manuscripts. You really give their whole life and put them in context. Yes, we do try. And I think one of the strengths of our collection is, you know, it's not the biggest um, Emily Dickinson or Robert Frost collection, but it does provide the context um, for their lives, um, especially Emily Dickinson's life. Good morning. I'm John Riley. I'm here on behalf of the Massachusetts Center for the Book and also for Northampton Community Television. We have an initiative to visit most of the public libraries in the Valley and see their special collections, see what sets them apart from all of the other libraries. As we know, New England is blessed with fabulous public libraries in all of its town, cities, and villages. And we're gonna to try to see exactly what sets each library apart, their special collections, their special holdings. And today we're at the Jones Library and we're meeting with Cindy Harbison, the curator of special collections. Cindy, uh, you're in charge of special collections. What other aspects of this uh, library is, is it contained here where we are right now? It's the special collections, archives, and then the fine art collection is all um, up here. Do you do a lot with genealogy as well? We do. We have a lot of genealogists. Coming. Do you get a lot of people coming and asking about their family's life here in, in yeah. town? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Now, you've only been here six months. How is that working out for you? It's been you? great. Yeah. I love it here. Yeah. Oh, it's really a dream job. Yeah, there's so much to learn and so much to do. Um, where did you grow up? I grew up in Connecticut. Uh -huh. So you know the area pretty mm -hmm. well, New England. You're, you're back home. You were at Appalachian State. Were you in the archives there? Yeah, I was the processing archivist there. Okay, yeah. Um, how long has Jones Library been in existence? Jones Library was incorporated in 1919 okay. um, after a bequest by Samuel Minot Jones, who's our founder. Um, Who was Mr. Jones? He was um, a lumberman. He grew up in Amherst, um, and his family has strong Amherst connections. Uh, he's related to Eugene Field um, and the Field family, um, who also were, were in Amherst for a time. Um, and then he went on to New York City, where he lived, um, and then... Um, maintained his connections with Amherst so that um, his will provided that if there were no heirs uh, that the money would come here to form a public library. Thank God for all these bachelors. Forbes Library was the same. The guy was never married, had no descendants, and left all of his money to, to the library. Was well, there... he was married. Oh, he was married. Okay, um, but no he, descendants. He had one son, okay. but um, Minot Jones was his son, and he died um, during World War One, oh, yeah. um, yeah. a few years after Samuel Minot Jones, so the money had been kept in trust for him, I and see. then, and then there was no heir at that point. So then it, it transferred here. Okay. That's good to get that clear. Was there a library here before the Jones Library? There were uh, both of the branches, the Munson Memorial and the North Amherst Library, um, were established well before the Jones was, and there was also a town, a smaller town library, that was in existence, and then they. Um, came sort of merged with the Jones once the Jones was established. Has the archive been here as long as the library? Is it uh, coeval? Almost. Um, mm -hmm. the, the archives and special collections, particularly the local history and genealogy collections, uh, have been around almost since 1919, since before we were actually in this building. Um, the uh, basis of the special collections um, is the Lucius Manlius Boltwood uh, genealogy and local history collections, um, and uh, they form the basis. So there, um, before the renovation, there were the Boltwood rooms where all the sort of local history and genealogy materials were kept. What are the oldest things you have here? What are the oldest uh, records, genealogical records that you have? The town is so old. Um, our oldest materials, most of our oldest materials, date back um, to the um, 17th and 18th century. We actually have a a will from 1434 
that's uh, <laughs> okay. this French will that we found that's part of um, the Charles Green Rare Book and Binding Collection. Uh -huh. um, and he has some of the oldest materials. There's some uh, books from the 1600s that he had collected. He was our first director, and he had a strong interest in special collections. I was going to ask you about him. I noticed on your website Charles Green was mentioned uh, both with Emily Dickinson and Robert Frost as being a big collector of both. So he was the spark for building those special collections? Yes, he's the reason we have such a, a vibrant and rich oh. um, special collections department. What um, about him? What, can you tell us anything about him? What, is, uh, what was his background? Do you know? Um, I don't know as much as I should yet because I'm still so new, but sure. um, I know that he was really interested in um, libraries. He started, before he was here, he was at um, Mass Agricultural College, which became UMass, mm -hmm. um, and he was librarian there, and then he was hired um, here in 1921, and he uh, was the director here until 1956. Wow, that's a long run. So he had yeah. a very long tenure, and then he kept on as um, emeritus librarian, mm -hmm. uh, at, and was basically the curator of special collections from, from then for several years after that. Yeah. I noticed that he corresponded regularly with Robert Frost, asking him for information and copies of his books and was very active in, in corresponding with Robert Frost. Yes. And well, must have been his friend. Uh, yes, they were yeah. friends and um, Charles Green recognized really early on before Robert Frost was, was really famous mm, okay. how important he was as a poet. Right, he might have just seemed like a local guy mm -hmm. at the time and yeah. didn't know he was going to be and, worldwide And famous. he really started the first collection of Robert Frost. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Robert Frost credits uh, the Jones Library as really his, his first collector under the, the stewardship of Charles that's, Green. That's really interesting. Now, you're currently collecting, still collecting things. Uh, what, what are you trying to collect now? Do you, obviously, if anything of Emily Dickinson's comes up, you're going to be attending to that and, and Robert Frost. What are you looking for? towards in the future collecting other things that you, you, you want to collect about Amherst history that are going on now? Yeah, we definitely are interested in current materials as well as historical materials mm. with an eye of, um, you know, this is going to be history someday. Um, I'm really interested in diversifying our collections mm -hmm. a little bit and bringing um, sort of the cult cultural and ethnic diversity that we have in, in town and, and ha make sure that's reflected in our collections. Um, we have a very strong Amherst Authors collection, and so it's important to me to continue to collect um, materials from current Amherst authors as well as ones that have lived here. Well, the library's lucky to have somebody young like you to be looking forward towards uh, what's coming. Uh, what is your uh, relationship with the Historical Society? Do you work together? Uh, do you collect together? Um, do you have different domains that you both try to emphasize? We have a great relationship. I love um, everyone at the Historical Society. Marianne Curling is the curator there. Um, and we have a great relationship and collaborate um, quite a bit. Um, we've often said that um, we sort of have two parts of the whole of Amherst history because we have the documents and the, the photographs and sort of paper materials here. Mm -hmm. And they have all the objects, artifacts, furniture, clothing, tools. Um, so those materials are there and they overlap extensively. So we'll have the letters and they'll have, you know, the, the gown that somebody wore mm -hmm. that really connects back together. Um, and so we do work together. A lot. How about the homestead? That's expanded so much over the last few years in, into a major museum. How do you work with them? Is there a coordination between Historical Society, you, and the homestead? And how does that work out? There is. The Emily Dickinson Homestead um, has been great in terms of collaboration. Um, the Emily Dickinson International Society is meeting in Amherst in August. Oh, and so um, the Emily Dickinson Museum and I and, and the Society, or not I, but the Jones Library, is um, going to be co-sponsoring the musical event that's happening that's, that'll be open to the public. So we do things like that. Um, and then we also collaborate with, you know, collection, because our collections overlap so much. And Where is the meeting going to be of this International Dickinson Society? Um, the board meeting is here at the Jones, and then most of the events are over at Amherst College. Okay. How many people show up for something like that, do you think? 
I don't know. I yeah. think at least a couple hundred. That'll be interesting. Yeah, they come from all over the world. It's I've heard it's pretty, pretty neat. I remember when we lived here in Amherst, uh, the, the the tourists always amazed me that that came, and I noticed quite a few Japanese tourists would come. That, and I always found like a kind of relationship between, say, Haiku and, mm -hmm. and Emily Dickinson, and uh, I think the Japanese really, really appreciate it. I'm sure there'll be a big contingent visiting from there. Um, do a lot of visitors come here to the library? Do you get uh, people coming up here just to touch and see and find out about Emily and, and Robert? Yeah, we get a lot of visitors. We get probably um, a thousand visitors a year. Yeah. Many of them come uh, to, just to walk around the exhibits and see the exhibit space um, or to come and look at specific... And you encourage that. You encourage yes. people coming. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. And they come to, you know, see the different collections or they're coming for, you know, serious research or genealogy yeah. research. Or that's, that's really great to hear because uh, Mass Center for the Book is really not just pursuing this initiative with public libraries, but trying to focus on the Connecticut River Valley as a book valley, both with uh, the book arts, binders, printers, but also writers, illustrators, and the libraries are a huge component. Uh, as well as museums and it's just great to have places like this where the public can come and visit as part of creating a book valley so people when they come there's there's places to go things to see um uh, you you have set aside some things for us to look at today and i'm, I'm really excited to uh, to see things i'm uh I'm a big fan of uh, both emily dickinson and robert frost and i've never really been here to to visit so Today's my big day, not just uh, NCTVs and Mass Center for the Books. Let's go see what you got. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, Cindy, you promised that you were going to show us some of your treasures. Here we are. What have you got? So we have just a small selection of some treasures. Um, to begin with, I brought, this is a photograph of Samuel Minot Jones, who is our founder. And um, I did say that uh, the Historical Society has most of the objects and we have most of the, the sort of more paper archives materials. Um, but there are some exceptions. And so I brought out um, Samuel Minot Jones's Civil War sword. Wow. Um, it's an AIM sword, which was made in Chicopee, uh, which is kind of neat. And then um, this is uh, Samuel Minot Jones's son's uh, duck. It's a female wooded merganser. Um, and he actually shot it himself and, and had it. And so this is sort of the example of one of the most unusual things we have in our collection. Um, I think he'd make a nice mascot uh, for the library, except I think you already have one. Is it an owl? Yeah, we have an owl. Yeah, if yeah. only he was an owl. Yeah. But um, what can you do? Uh, and then I pulled out several things related to the Emily Dickinson collection we have. Um, this is one of the few letters that we have... Um, that Emily Dickinson wrote. Uh, it's to her uncle Joseph Sweetser um, that she wrote in 1858. And we have four of her manuscript poems, including uh, We Play at Paste, uh, which is a really um, special addition to our collection. And then we also have um, a pretty complete set of editions of her poems. Um, so this is the first edition that was published in 1890, um, after her death, of course. But um, uh, So we have a copy of, of that edition, um, which is pretty special. And then we also have what we call the Dickinson Reading Collection, which are copies of books that she would have read um, or were owned in her household. That's really interesting. Now, did you have to go back and reconstitute this library, or these books that you had or did you have a, a reading list that you could go back and try to re recreate? There was a reading list um, of ones that um, we knew were in her house. Uh, there was actually a whole book written about, you know, sort of the books that she read and um, her father Edward Dickinson was, um, you know, highly uh, literate um, as a lawyer and and so these are not the actual copies that she owned but they're the same edition of the book so you can sort of get a sense of what she would have read and this what one book is that? Uh, this is Mitchell's ancient atlas which would have been um, the geography book that she had when she attended Amherst Academy um, are there still books that you're looking for 
Uh, it's a pretty complete set, and as far as I know, um, there aren't others uh, that we're looking for to add. How many How many books do you think uh, you have from her library? Um, we have, there's, I think, over, there's definitely over 100, um, and probably closer to 200. It takes up, um, like, two shelf ranges. Um, I think that's really interesting. I see other um, libraries doing similar things, trying to reconstitute the library of the, uh, of the author. They did it with Edith Wharton over at the Mount. Um, I, I think it's a really worthwhile pastime to really recreate their life and, and the books that influenced them, and especially with Emily Dickinson. She was so literate, and, and books played such a large part in her life. Yeah, yeah, it's a really great collection, and we have similar collections where, um, like with Robert Francis, the poet, we have books that he actually owned, um, and so we sort of have his library, and they're his editions of, of ones that he owned. Yeah. Um, in terms of context for um, Emily Dickinson's life, we have um, really rich collections um, that sort of showcase um, the different um, other parts of life. So this is one of the account books. Um, it was the Cutler General Store account book, and it actually shows um, the purchases that were made um, by um, the Dickinson household and also her brother's uh, Austin Dickinson's household, and so you can see that she's purchasing, you know, brown sugar and flour to make all of her um, cakes and, and things that she was so well known for, um, and, and really get a sense of what was available in Amherst at the time. Now, you laid to rest a little myth the last time I visited here about Emily Dickinson lowering poems to the children outside of her house. You said that that might have been true, but she did lower cookies and cakes out her window. Yes, I think she did lower poems, and, and in ca some cases she would attach notes um, with the cakes. And the, So we have one um, in our collection that refers to um, a cake that we think um, was attached as a gift, and so she wrote a little poem and also had um, cakes with it. I wonder um, if there's an Emily Dickinson cookbook. There is, um, okay. when I was at the homestead years and years ago, they had a little book that had her recipes that she was That would be really interesting to, to see. Yeah, I'll have to check that out when I go over there. And then um, the other one that sort of is, um, provides some context to what was going on in Amherst uh, during Emily's life, um, we have some items from Henry Jackson, Henry Jackson, um, who was a, his, this is his business card. He was one of the most prominent African Americans at the time, and uh, he lists uh, his his occupation here as truckman, uh, oh, but really he was also known as a teamster. And so we have um, those items, and then this is one of his photograph albums, which is one of the the most beautiful albums. That is I've the most seen. elaborate binding I think I've ever seen. Yeah, and um, and so it has all these great images of his family and members of the community. Could you hold that up just a little bit of an angle? Yeah. Um, and so it's just a really neat treasure. Um, you can see, you know, what people wore and how they were. Could you turn it um, sideways so we can get that at the right angle? Yeah, there we go. That is a real showpiece, yeah, um, to show black lives at that time. Yeah, um, and we don't we don't have enough about you know the collected for you know African Americans uh, in Amherst, um, but that's at least one one that we do. Yeah, that's really great. I never know about that. Um, I think our viewers will be happy to see that. And then we, we have editions of, of Emily Dickinson poetry, including whenever it's been translated to other languages. So this one um, is has been translated. It's a complete set of her poems translated into Japanese. Um, and then this one is an example of uh, her poems being translated into Greek, which is um, kind of neat. And uh, certainly presents some challenging for our catalogers to sort of <laughs> create records. Wouldn't Emily for them. be surprised at how famous she became? She had so little recognition in her own life. Yeah, and then um, so we have Emily Dickinson, and then of course Robert Frost, 
Um, and we have a really rich Robert Frost collection. Um, like Emily Dickinson, we have Frost editions. Um, this is one example that he um, inscribed to the Jones Library. Um, so it says, to the Jones Library from an old friend, uh, Robert Frost, um, when he was in Amherst. Um, and he, he signed several to the Jones Library to Charles Green. Um, and then we have other copies. He was uh, kind of stingy with his uh, signatures. I always heard the story that if somebody came up and asked for him to autograph a book, he'd say one of two things. If you can recite one of my poems, I'll sign it. Or give me a dollar. <laughs> he was a tough customer in some yeah. ways. Um, and then we have a lot of his um, original manuscripts, which is a really neat aspect to the collection. This is one of his manuscript books that we have. This is wow. for A Further that is Range, amazing. Yeah. which won the Pulitzer Prize in 1937. Um, and so it's uh, like a complete handwritten copy of how the book was published. Um, and most of them appear, the poems appear um, in their final versions, but there are you know, a few different um, minor revisions that have been made. I love his handwriting. It's, yes. it's just beautiful. Yeah. Now, do you have scholars coming to uh, study this manuscript? or We get scholars studying um, sort of all aspects of the Frost collection. Um, Lately, they've been very interested in his letters because there's a project to publish a complete set of his letters. So you said they're publishing uh, his letters. Who who is the publisher? Um, Belknap and Harvard. Ah, uh, that's a natural. They must have a large collection of his items too. They, they have everything. Yeah, yeah. It's Harvard. Um, yeah. So this is the first volume that that was uh, published, I believe, last year. Um, with his letters, so it's the first set from 1886 to 1920. Um, and so our letters from, uh, that he wrote as a young man to Sabra Peabody when he was, um, I think 11 or 12, um, <laughs> are in this book. That is amazing. There. That is really, really um, cool. So this is one of my favorite of um, Robert, Francis, uh, Robert Frost manuscripts that we have in our collections. It's the um, draft of Stopping by Woods, and it shows, um, the revisions that he made to it, which is really neat to sort of Probably retrace. his most famous poem. Yes. Um, and we have um, school kids who come in every year and they have a little project where they sit in our exhibit room and they discuss, you know, why he made such changes um, to it, which is really That's neat. really important, yeah. Um, and then connected with the Robert Frost collection, we have this amazing collection of woodcuts from J.J. Lankey's. Um, and so most of the illustrations that appeared in um, Frost's books were woodcuts by Lankies. Um, this is the original woodblock for Calf Pasture Gate. Um, this is a really special collection. I had no idea you had these. Yeah, we have several woodcuts and then um, many, many of the prints from the woodcuts. Um, was Robert Frost friends with this artist? He was. Um, they, Lankies met Frost at a poetry reading. Um, and they became friends. They lived um, fairly nearby. This uh, is the print from that woodblock, um, and it's actually um, a view on Robert Frost's farm. Um, Just beautiful. Oh my God, that is so so simple, uh, but just perfect for this area, for this part of the country. Yeah, many of the Christmas cards that Robert Frost would send out were illustrated with woodcuts by Lankies. There, and then um, we have um, a great collection of Robert Francis materials. Um, Robert Francis was um, called by Robert Frost the best neglected poet. Um, and Francis has a really strong connection with um, the Jones Library. He helped design an early herb garden, and um, then he would uh, use one of the study rooms that they had in the early days um, to do a lot of his writing and did a lot of poetry readings and things here. So we have a, a great collection of his editions. Um, this is his autobiography that he signed. Um, and, and he was a friend of the Jones as well, like Robert Frost was a friend of the library. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, very much so. Um, and then this is uh, one of his manuscript poems that appears in his papers. This one is Sheep. 
Very beautiful handwriting as well. Yeah. So we have that. Uh, one of the other really great collections we have is the Clifton Johnson collection. He was uh, a writer and illustrator and photographer uh, who lived in Hadley. And um, his first book uh, that he published um, was The New England Country. And he had done lots of illustrations um, for other books and, and photographs before that. Um, but this is one that he did himself, and he actually designed the cover piece for it too, and then provided all of the photographs and illustrations that are, are in that. And he traveled um, all across the country um, doing his Highways and Byways of America series, where, um, so there's Highways and Byways of New England, and then in 1901 and 1902 he went um, throughout the South and did Highways and Byways of the South, and he visited the Tuskegee Institute. Um, and so this is a photograph of um, Booker T. Washington with um, his son David picking strawberries. Oh my goodness, and, um, that is just great. And that's his photograph. That's his photograph. And he also met George Washington Carver and took um, other photographs of the area. And then he would travel around to um, all areas um, of the South and then, and then throughout the country. And um, he was really interested in sort of the rural people's experience. Um, so very much more the byways than the highways. Um, and he made his living as an author. As an author and an illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he, um, he started out more as an illustrator um, and, then, and then also wrote um, numerous books, over 100 books. Um, and then this is one of his illustrations. He did a lot of uh, pen and ink drawings. Um, that are just delightful. This one is from the Land of Heathers. Um, it appeared in that book, and um, he traveled uh, to England, Ireland, and Scotland in 1896 um, to do photography and then illustrations um, for some books. And he combined it, he was very shrewd, and combined it with his honeymoon. So um, they, they honeymooned and he got some business done you know, <laughs> at the same time. How New England, how Yankee. Yeah. And he started out, um, he taught for a year at the Hockenham Schoolhouse. Um, and his wife actually taught there before they were married. So he had a very strong interest in education um, and, and things. And so um, he had a, a large school book collection that he donated to um, the Jones here. And so there's lots of um, 19th century and 18th century school books as examples from that. And so this one is um, Asa Gray's How Plants Grow. Um, this is a great window into so. society at that time, the school books. I mean, it was kind of neglected that, you know, you'd have your school book and get rid of it, that somebody collected them. It's just great. Yeah, he has a great collection, and there's all these science textbooks and um, philosophy um, a lot of deportment books, so, you know, how you're supposed to behave and act and, and things that is... Um, that was a real New England uh, specialty, I think. I, I ran into that at the Forbes, too, these very Victorian uh, stories for children on how to treat their parents and how to be good students and not lazy and all the rest. So yes. Definitely a New England trait. Um, and then... Um, Going along with sort of our Amherst Authors collection, we have um, some materials, uh, especially early editions of the books of Charles Eastman. So this is um, a photograph by Frank Waugh of Charles Eastman, um, who lived in Amherst. Um, he moved here in, uh, I think, 1902 or 1903, and he lived here for about a dozen years. Um, and most of his books um, were, he did a lot of his writing uh, during that period. Was he Native American? He was a Native American, um, and he became a doctor, um, and then was at, um, came back to New England and, and did a lot of writing. Interesting. Um, I'm, I'm finding out so many things I didn't know about today. Um, but so this is one of his books. He was one of the first uh, Native Americans to write about um, Native Americans' experience from from. A native perspective, um, and so this is one of his first, one of his books, and he um, he signed it. 
there. It's a really special thing. Do you have anything of Helen Hunt Jackson's shoes? We do. I the... didn't bring anything out, but we do have several of her books and um, some of her manuscript materials. She really was a mover and shaker for um, helping the Native Americans of this country. She, and I think she was the first secretary of um, Bureau of Indian Affairs, I guess they called it. And uh, So that's quite a, an accomplishment for her. Yeah, and then his, so Charles Eastman's wife, Elaine Goodale Eastman, um, was also involved with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and she was a writer too, and they wrote um, several things together, like this one, and this one is signed by her, uh, made out to her friend. It'd be interesting to, to put Helen Hunt Jackson in context with these other people. There must have been a, a group uh, that was interested in this area, maybe along with the people that were interested in you know, anti-slavery movements, maybe they then became aware of you know, problems with, with Native Americans as well. And then uh, the last items that I pulled are both from the Julius Lester collection yes. um, and showcase that we're still sort of collecting things mm -hmm. today. Um, we're so fortunate to have his papers um, here. We have a, a complete set of the books that he wrote. He's written over 40 books. Um, picture books and books for young adults and memoirs and this is um, the first book he wrote it was co-written with Pete Seeger and it's a folk singer's guide to the the 12th string guitar um, and it includes the records that were um, were featured so you could listen to the music as well um, and uh, Julius Lester has a lot of um, music in his collection and then we have his correspondence and um, journals and photographs and it's an extremely rich collection he was he is a, a wonderfully interesting man he's done so much um, and he worked with civil rights he was a professor at UMass for many many years um, and did what have you got there in your hand so this is his first journal from 1956-57 um, and he journaled a lot and this is an example of um, the first one we have when he was a young, very young man. Now, looking at the fragility of that paper, um, you as an archivist, you must have climate control, uh, humidity controls, all kinds of things going on to, to, prefer, to preserve these documents? We do. We do. We put everything in acid-free folders and boxes, and then we have climate control to control the temperature and humidity, um, and then provide security to the collections. Um, are you trying well. to digitize any of these documents? Or are you? We do. We have a, a site where a lot of our materials, particularly our photographs, have been digitized. It's um, digitalamherst.org. And so a lot of the Clifton Johnson materials and um, our early photographers, um, like Lincoln Barnes and John Lovell, are on there, and we're adding to that. Um, other materials. Can people access that through the Jones Library website? Yes, if they go to the Jones Library website and then um, Special Collections, um, there's a link to it there, or you can go directly to digitalamherst.org and, and get in. Well, Cindy, you've given us a great tour. We've seen a lot of treasures. I think uh, the viewers are really going to be thrilled to see these things that maybe, like me, they didn't know existed. And I've got to say that I think that this treasure house and this archive is in very good hands with somebody who is as forward-looking as you are. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>